how many people here know or have actually used Meteor? A couple of people? How many people know about Meteor? You've heard about it. You've heard it mentioned. And a couple of people have heard about Node.js, right? <laughs> Everybody's wandering around looking, how do I do Node.js? How do I do this? How do I get this into Drupal? Um, so we thought it would be really interesting to talk about our own experience with Meteor. Um, one of the reasons why we chose uh, Meteor for our app that we did, and then uh, some of the stuff Meteor does really well, some of the stuff that it doesn't do so well, and then if you were to actually, you know, make a love child, which we are doing right now, um, with the Barry White music in the background, like one of our developers is <laughs> clicking away with this, uh, what it would look like, and then if we put that out, you know, a couple years, uh, what it's actually going to look like because we're just going to have a, a merging of these technologies over time just like we're seeing you know with static PHP uh, getting Ajax and adding that interactive element it's going to just get more and more baked into the into the apps so with that um, we're just going to go over a couple um, big points and then I'm going to hand off to Steve with some of the more technical stuff um, about the things that we're mentioning so one of the biggest things that's really cool about Meteor is um, it's at, everything is running client side. And they have this kind of voodoo magic where uh, things are syncing back and forth, but you've got a MongoDB essentially on the client side in the browser, the client's browser, and you have one on the server. And when you make changes, um, that stuff is syncing, which we're going to talk about in a minute, but all the, the action, the, the, the app essentially is running on the browser. So when you're making changes, you're moving it, you're making changes on your actual app locally, and then that stuff is getting sent back. So um, it, does a, it does a bunch of cool things. Uh, the first thing is when you make a change, it happens right there. It's not making a change and then waiting for a refresh or sending back to the server and then coming back and you're waiting for it. Um, it's just really fast. So you make the change, it sends it back, and then it, it has this conflict resolution algorithm technology that if there's a conflict, it comes back and tells you like, oh, that didn't really work. Um, but for the most part, it tries to massage it all so that it's pretty seamless. Uh, and then, so, yeah. So, so the client can actually make a. So the client can actually, you know, a, a user can can make a change on the site, and um, it'll that'll actually change on on their client side. But then on the server side, once the the client and the server have actually been able to communicate and talk, if something actually hasn't happened, or if something's not going well, or the permissions or or, or whatnot is not is not good, then it comes back, and the uh, the client will actually revert the change automatically. Um, so the, the user experience is, is very seamless, and they're not necessarily seeing um, this lag between the, the server and the, and the client. Yeah, so then uh, naturally you're going to have uh, performance, like he's saying, the seamlessness of the performance. And then you're going to have a bandwidth savings, because you're not sending everything back and forth all the time. You're doing a bunch of changes, and it's only sending back to the server what it actually needs to. Uh, and you're actually the CPU cycles, right? We're sh uh, shoving off a lot of these CPU cycles for your application um, client side, rather than the server trying to get bogged down doing all the actual processing of your application. So you can imagine the, the Drupal templating engine is, is a pretty uh, robust beast. So um, every time a client comes to the server and asks for information, the server is crunching away over and over. On the, I mean, you've got caching and whatnot, but it still has to compile all this HTML and integrate all this information from the database. Whereas in Meteor, what's really going on is the, the client and the server are just exchanging the, the data, and the, the client already has the templating engine on, its, on, the, on the client. So you're essentially saving and distributing a lot of the, the processor power to the, cl to the client itself and saving a lot of uh, CPU there. Yeah, it, it's, it's kind of interesting that, that just to bring this out of the abstract, a very specific concrete example is let's say you've got a table with information uh, and the, the connection to the server is saying that this table is a representation of a bunch of data in a database. What, is en what ends up happening is Meteor listens to the server and when it hears that uh, the server tells it that one entry changed um, on, the, on, on, the, on the server side, Meteor just updates the one or two or five table entries that it actually needs to. So it only re-renders that one little bit, and the entire page stays the same. And when you look at it in the, in the Drupal world, you would have to do a whole PHP page refresh to get that new information. So that's pretty cool. 
Um, the next point is the SEO kind of sucks on Meteor rendered pages. Um, and this is kind of like the beginning of our Meteor love child, Drupal Meteor love child, because if you look at our, like our app Pushpin Planner, um, incidentally, I've been made aware that if you go to it on mobile, you get a security certificate warning because the dub 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 for some reason on mobile is giving an issue. But um, this is the page, right? I mean, this is <laughs> this is how Google's gonna gonna make us millionaires, right? Like it's uh, it, it can't make any sense of this. So that's a big problem because the entire page is getting served from this, you know, from this this embedded stuff, and uh, it decides what to render and what to show you based off of a bunch of information that. Uh, that, that you're communicating in your app, but for, as an anonymous, not logged in user, there's no information there. Um, there's yeah, they do have modules on the way that are trying to address this. Like there's a Spiderable module that, that actually tries to make all of your links, um, you know, SEO searchable, but it's, it's still not, you know, up to par uh, as to what we need. And by not up to par, it does absolutely nothing. You install <laughs> it and it does nothing. So uh, we need a little bit better than that. So, uh, and I'll tell you kind of how we address this, but the other things that are kind of interesting, uh, there are some routing issues, and this is something that we as a community are gonna have to address. When you have single page apps, you know, how does Google find anything, right? It's, it's all loaded as, a, it's like Flash essentially. We go back to the Flash days. And so we have to figure out a way to, um, I, I suspect that in the coming years, uh, we're gonna have a change in the way that we're tying SEO to, to, to routes but in the meantime, we've got to get routing in there. So uh, Meteor just recently um, is, has put the finishing touches on its routing package as Contrib. It's not even baked into the core yet. Um, but you can do routing, and we do have routing. Um, but the other thing that's difficult is, like in Drupal, when you have a question, what do you do? Right? You go to Google, and you're like, hey, tell me the answer. And Google's like, here you go. Here's 50 examples. So with Meteor and Node, when you have a question, specifically with Meteor, you look up Meteor, uh, one of two things happen. First thing, it tells you about Russia's uh, Meteor thing that came in and crashed through a bunch of people's windows, and you're like, that doesn't help me. And then the next thing that happens to us is uh, we've produced a lot of content about Meteor. So when we have a question, we go look on Google, and then our blog posts come up, and then that's not so helpful. Although uh, one, of our <laughs> one of our developers, we had a problem, and he's like, man, I found this really cool blog post that answered my question. And then I looked, and I realized it was on our website. <laughs> It was Rick who had produced this blog, and he answered our question for us. But that's the problem when you're in new stuff, is there's just not as much information out there, and it gets to be really challenging. So the way that we address that is we we're thinking about, um, we're trying to find the way through the forest of uh, Drupal and Node, or Drupal and Meteor. And uh, what we came to the conclusion of is what we need to do is make a Meteor site, uh, or a Meteor app, and then have a Drupal site that does all the actual Drupal stuff that a CMS does. And so what we're doing right now is we're converting our front page to be a Drupal front page, and the blogs will be Drupal, and the, uh, the, the API documentation, because we have a full REST API, that'll be Drupal. But then the actual app itself will be Meteor. And so what we really like about this, we'll just sort it out with either Nginx or a subdomain or something. But uh, it first off allows us to do, you know, work Drupal into it, because we're a Drupal shop. Um, but it also lets us have stuff that's, you know, we don't want to reinvent a CMS. We've got a lot of years of Drupal development and, and contribution to this community. Why are we going to try to redo that in uh, Meteor? And if you look at the overall trends of where we're headed, uh, technical people want to, like, do technical, cool, fun stuff. But at a certain point, we're reinventing the wheel a lot. And that's why Drupal has been able to be so successful, is because uh, it's allowed us to leverage a lot of our uh, work that we've been redoing over and over again. I mean, you think about like 10 years ago when your client, when you came to actually do an app and or some website and you're like, okay, I got to do the administration panel now. First off, there's no budget for it, right? Nobody wants to pay for that. It looks horrible. Uh, they just want the bare minimum. It's like the most monotonous, horrifying work. Shoot me in the head. Like, I don't want to do this, but you have to. And Drupal kind of made it so that we don't have to do that stuff anymore. And it's really fun. So. Uh, I'm really interested in exploring ways for us to leverage what Drupal does really well, leverage what Meteor does really well, and I think this is kind of like a good, good way through that. Um, let me start my presentation again. So the next thing, uh, event-driven socket I.O. baked right in. Um, so Steve's going to want to talk about this, but uh, essentially, uh, 
I'm, I, we kind of touched on this, but everything happens as a function of changes in the database. So whereas with PHP um, and, and, and Drupal, we're loading the page and then we're making changes on the page and the content depending on what we see in the database at that time uh, or what cookie is stored or, you know, then you run into caching issues and you've got to have some asynchronous stuff that does some magic after the page renders. Uh, with Meteor, you just throw it up on the page and then whenever anybody makes any change anywhere that affects any individual granular piece of content on the page, it automatically comes down the pipe and updates it, which is so cool. I mean, it's like, uh, you, you can talk about it. But. So subscriptions in, in Meteor are, are much like, um, it's kind of like the select of, um, for MySQL. So um, what really ends up happening is the, um, you've got to set up this, your, your database and you've got all this data in there, but what is the client going to have access to? I mean, you, let's say you've got um, a huge database with all this information in it and you've got a client side database. So, I mean, imagine having all this data. You can't really um, push it all to the, to the client. There's just too much to, to deal with. So what ends up happening is the, the client makes a subscription to the server. It says, hey, I need to know about um, this specific piece of data and it can, it can also pass you know, an identifier of what, what it's actually looking for. So on the server side, the server says, okay, this guy's subscribing to, uh, in our case, boards. And you know, we're, gonna, we're gonna actually need to know who the user is and what they need to know. And so, so it's gonna gather it all up and just package up the information that they need to know. Because let, let's say you have, um, it, you know, in our, in our, in our app, we, let's say you've got like 500 boards, which is you know, essentially a, you know, it's, it's kinda hard to explain exactly because it, you know, we gotta show you the app, but the boards are a place where you can arrange all of your cards and um, the cards, you know, you're going to have 50 cards in each board. So if you've got 500 boards, you can imagine that the amount of data that you're going to need to be tracking is, is, is immense. But if you're only on this particular board at this one time, you only need to see the, the, the cards and the, the, the information of those cards at that time. So, you know, essentially the, the yeah, the, the <coughs> the card is really going to, um, you're only going to see the cards on the client that you need to see. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll take it like where, where this gets really cool, and by the way, we may want to hold right here right, so it doesn't get all, make the noise. Uh, what, what, what's really cool with that, this sounds like a really abstract thing, but it's just, it's like Google Docs, you know, you're typing and you see what somebody else is typing, um, this event-driven stuff and how that applies to Meteor. In our specific cases, we've got a card, how we, how we work with our app, is we'll all log in and then we see all these cards that we have to do that we're managing our resources. And the moment anybody anywhere makes a change, it shows up for everybody at the same time, which is really, really cool. It's like, I feel like we got all this technology for free. We didn't even have to figure it out. It just works out of the box. Um, but the bottom line of what Steve was uh, pointing to is you subscribe to data and the server tells you what you need. And you always have 100% of what you need. You don't have to select the data from this subset of doing this or doing this from this massive amount of data that you have. You just say, okay, give me everything that I have that I need and the server gives it all to you and you do everything with it. And then you just, it's like if you were cooking, you just always had the, uh, the ingredients on your table that you needed at that moment. Um, and there were people like removing and adding and giving you all that stuff that you need to make that dish. And you can just make a really amazing course. And you never have to go to the fridge to get anything. You just always have 100% of what you need. And, and it's just, it's refreshing and it's really amazing and uh, you don't have to worry about any of the stuff that you, or a lot of the stuff that you have to worry about in PHP. Um, so, uh, you know, the, on the other side, of that, oh, did you want to add something to that? No, that's good. So on the other side of that, uh, single page apps, they, they kind of take a new way of thinking and I mentioned this earlier, um, you know, routing, right? You, you make this one page and you're like, okay, it's really cool, but then you have SEO issues like we were just talking about. And then you might say, okay, well, we want to display information, in our case, we want to display information to anonymous users that is actually authenticated information with a big MD5 hash you know, uh, key so that people can connect to this. Or with the API, um, you need to have routing. And so now you need to start thinking about, whereas with Drupal, that's just kind of baked in. You just make a menu hook, right? And you can add all sorts of cool stuff. At any route, you can put wildcards in there. Um, you can pass arguments in this routing. With Meteor, that's not developed. So 
uh, you really have to start stepping back and thinking about how are you going to be passing information to your app, what are you going to be ex exposing to people at every particular route, uh, what are you going to be exposing to Google. Um, it, just, it just takes an extra level of thought, whereas with Drupal it's kind of baked in. Um, you know, data hiding, uh, you wanna sh we've, we've got a really robust caching system um, you know, in, in Drupal with, uh, with, with Meteor, you know, to that end of like exposing everything that you need. We encountered issues uh, for performance because um, we were exposing these feeds, these subscriptions of data to anonymous users because Meteor is saying, okay, I want to see all the cards that, that I need to be dealing with at this time. But the user's anonymous, they're on the front page. They don't need cards, they'll never need cards. So you're, you're keeping that overhead uh, to possibly give them cards um, in the event that they do need them, but they never will. And so this takes the developer to say, whoa, I've got this big pipe like going to the client, and uh, that's kind of dumb to do that. But if you looked at every single example on Google about Meteor, no one ever says, hide this if they're anonymous. It just says, like, this is the example. You include this subscription, and this is how you define your collections, and everything's good. And for the most part, it's pretty good, because a lot of people haven't done some really big production apps with this, and nobody's kind of encountered this stuff. And so uh, we've got to start you know, thinking through this now. Yeah, th there was one thing that we weren't expecting um, with Meteor that, that you don't really deal with in Drupal, is that Meteor has to, to, to keep that subscription alive. It has to keep track of each of these different users individually, which is something we just really didn't think about. But, um, but you know, now that we know, it's, it makes a lot of sense. But the subscriptions are, are tied to the client. The client is asking for something very specific. He's sending something very specific. So each one of those collections and, or, and subscriptions is, is really important to, to keep to a minimum, because otherwise, you know, you're just going to continue to use up more server resources. And that was one of the main problems that we ran into when we were working on our app. Uh, so it's got a unique way of exposing data. Um, I think we actually just kind of rehashed this in something else, so, or what we were talking about before. But um, it, it exposes, I mean, it's, it's kind of permissions too. So um, with Drupal, you can go in, you got a bunch of check boxes uh, to, to check and say what you want to expose to everybody. With Meteor, it's just baked right in. On the server side, you define a subscription, you say this is what somebody who passes these arguments in should be seeing. And uh, it just gives them all that. With, uh, with, with Drupal, you've got to actually, I mean, you could screw yourself, right? I mean, you can leave some permissions off of some view, or you could uh, forget, you know, you're testing and you, uh, you, you, you leave like some access callback um, as always to return true or whatever. And there's a lot of, I mean, who knows how much Drupal code out there is people just left exposure to, of, to data and they didn't even realize it and nobody realizes it until you know, somebody encounters it or somebody exploits it or whatever. Um, with this, it's very clear. The moment you expose this data to the client, you have very clear inputs and you have very clear outputs in the subscription. It's just very concise. It's not like you give all these permissions and then you kind of have to remember to go back and define the permissions. It's just baked right in. So. Yeah, when I was talking about the subscriptions, the subscriptions for media is really kind of the select. Um, the permission scheme is really more of the update, the delete, and the, you know, and, and the insert. So in Meteor, um, you really control all the permissions on the database level. And, and because Meteor is really just exchanging data mostly and not HTML, um, all, you know, the permissions are going to be all isolated on the database itself. So in Drupal, you have all these issues where you've got permissions, you know, you, you've got modules asking for permissions, you might have some crazy block that's asking for permissions, and it's just all out there in, 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 in your app, whereas in Meteor, you've, you've got it all concisely arranged in the, uh, in the database itself. So on the client side, you know, most of the, because all the templates are triggered off the database itself, the client is actually making database calls to itself on the client, and the permissions are all run through there. So if you do an insert, it goes to the server and says, does this, permi does this user have permission to, to insert? And if they do, then it returns a, you know, they have permission, and then the, 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 the client will, will get the new data, and the, the, the UI will be updated. Whereas in, uh, in Drupal, um, you know, the, people don't really spend time thinking about 
this table needs this access here or there. It's really, um, it's much more higher level than that, and it's, it's really actually much harder to, to deal with the permissions like that. So the, the next thing is that um, MongoDB can, can really bite you. Like you've got to spend some time thinking about the structure of your collections because um, if you do it wrong, uh, it, can be, it can be disastrous. I mean, you can get down a path that you've got to just redo everything in order to make it work um, because you're not just putting a bunch of data in a bunch of tables and rows that are easily queryable. You're making structures. You're making data structures, essentially, that you've got to think about how you're going to be access the, accessing this data in your application. So it really requires a uh, different way of thinking about your app, like how are you going to associate things. A perfect example is in our, in our application, you can share boards with other people. So this board um, needs to have a reference. I mean, when we first thought about it and we didn't think about sharing, it's like, okay, the board's going to have a user ID reference, right? Well, okay, now um, we want to share it with multiple people. So, uh, okay, we'll make the user ID an array and you can have multiple user IDs. Well, okay, now some people are making cards um, and the card has, is associated to the board and the user. So now you've got uh, people making cards and adding it to somebody else's board, right? Like how does that work with subscriptions, right? Like you, get, you can only make so many cards um, before it says, hey, pay up. And uh, you know, if you made a bunch of cards on somebody else's board, how does that work? And these are just questions that you end up with going down this path and you're like, oh shoot, we didn't think about that. And this is kind of uh, opposite to sometimes what this like agile approach to application uh, um, you know, deployment and development is. In my previous talk that I gave on Friday, uh, I said, you know, don't think about all this stuff, just get it out the door, right? Uh, whatever you gotta do, just make compromises, just push your app, you just gotta push, push, push. Well now I'm saying, don't do that. <laughs> you gotta structure it really well so you don't screw yourself. Um, so what, what is the solution to that? I don't know. You got to have a, a, a smart guy who can just get it right the first time. Um, that's, why, that's why Steve's here. So, uh, you know, it works out really well. But you just got to make sure that, you know, you're, you're thinking as much as you can about the structure of this stuff rather than just kind of cramming stuff into collections. Because Drupal, we can just make a table and we can just adjust tables. And uh, that's super simple. Um, but this, it's the very nature of your app, the structure of your app. So, you just got to be careful. And to get specific, that one of the main challenges is joins. I mean, with Mongo, you don't have a join. So when you're, when you're thinking about all these different types of objects you have, um, you've got to decide, am I going to build this really complex document that I'm going to store in one collection, and then I'm going to use Mongo to, to find some of these deep, um, you know, some of the data that's deeply, you know, you've got arrays and arrays and objects and objects and all that kind of stuff. Are you going to, are you going to use, utilize it that way? And, um, or are you going to create multiple collections and then go through the headache of saying, okay, well, I've got a board ID here, and now I've got to link it to another collection here. And, you know, I mean, essentially you have to really understand that you're not going to be able to easily join this data together. And is it going to be better for me to go down and, and make a, a really complex object, which makes querying for it very easy, or are you going to, but then it makes, you know, updating and, and finding it much harder or are you going to make it so you have multiple collections and, and then updating the, the smaller documents is much easier, but then you have to go through all this headache of, of combining IDs and, and kind of linking things up together. Yeah, think about the hairiest MySQL uh, select you've ever done, like multiple joins and like nested selects and you know, just left joins and right joins and all sorts of crazy stuff and you've got it in this one command. Uh, What's that? It goes on for pages. Yeah, like look at a view query, right? Um, you know, like in Drupal 6, this was turned on by default, I think. You would look at this crazy query, and you're like, whoa, that's really big. And then sometimes it would be screwed up, and you'd have to go through and try to understand what's going on here. And you try that for about a minute, and you're like, okay, screw that, I gotta have another approach. Because it's really complex. Um, you can't really do that in Mongo. You can't make these really complicated queries. It's got a level of abstraction that it's letting you do some stuff, but for the most part, when you want to do that, you got to do it the hard way. You got to select everything and then parse through that and then select stuff off of that ID and then go through that. Now, Mongo is really fast, so you know, at the end of the day, it's probably about the same amount of time, but um, it's just a lot more work. And uh, when we're coding, uh, you want to do as little work as you can because you got a big sprint that you're kind of trying to get through. 
So it's just something to think about. The last thing that we're actually going to probably release a package for in Meteor is schema updates. Uh, how about this, right? You, you update your module, and you run update.php, and it's like, OK, we've got to run some schema updates, right? And it goes through this you know, loop of it's changing this ID in this table, and it's adding a new table, and it's migrating the data over. And you know that you ran it, and everything's cool. Well, there's nothing like that in Meteor. And in fact, in any node application, you're going to have to manage all this stuff yourself. So how does that play, right? You're developing this application. You push it out. Everything's great, except this thing has a big bug. You've got to fix it, right? So you go through and you update the collection locally. You, you, uh, you, your code deals with this new data. And it's your dev instance. It's your local dev instance. So everything's fresh. So everything's beautiful. You push it to production. And then it doesn't work because there's all these other people's data from the old way. And then you get all these bugs, and you get all these uh, errors, and everybody's page is, is dying. So uh, how do you manage that? Right? This, is, this is really tricky. So the, one of the ways that we've done it uh, is we've actually made a server-side call that will go through and update everything in everybody's collection. So we've got to make a migration. Um, and then uh, you know, how do you know that you actually ran that? Right? You deploy the code. And then client-side, you can call that function to go through and update everything. Uh, but you don't know if you ran it or not. So Drupal makes that really easy. Meteor needs a little work in that department. So we're going to learn from Drupal and apply that same kind of idea to Meteor. Did you want to say something yeah. about that? And also, one thing that, that, that I've found is really difficult with, uh, with Mongo is at any given point with MySQL, you can go in and, and you can check what the schema looks like. You can see what, what tables and columns that you have. But in Mongo, you're able to insert documents any kind of document. So you could act, I mean, you have to kind of keep track of how am I building this document. You have to almost keep documentation of what your document looks like. And it's not as easy to keep that up to date as it is your database itself. So um, it's really challenging when developers come in. They're like, oh, how, how do I build this document? Well, in, in MySQL, you can just go look at the table, and, and you'll see exactly what, what you're supposed to do. But in, uh, in Mongo, you're, you, you go to this documentation and say, oh, is it up to date? Is this how the document is currently looking? Well, it, hopefully it is, because if it's not, you're going to run into a lot of issues. Yeah, I mean, we, we had that problem, right? You, you have, a, you have a, a user ID, or you, you have a user object, and then somebody gets this really great idea, and they're like, OK, I'm going to make this new element in the user object that's going to check, and it's going to see whether it needs to do this other stuff. So then everybody that doesn't have that either doesn't have that functionality because they didn't give them that object. They didn't go back and give all the old people this new field. Um, or uh, you know, it, something breaks because their code expects that thing there. So that's a big problem. Um, and I don't know, do, do, have people used Mongo in here? Or is this a kind of total, kind of completely new? Sure. Yeah, it's, we've kind of played around with it, right? We don't really have that much of a reason in Drupal. But like what Steve was saying, you can push anything you want into a Mongo collection. There's no schema. You don't define it. It's like the Wild West. So uh, that's kind of cool, and it's kind of scary. And we've just got to figure out how to navigate that. And there's also very poor, there's not like a PHP MyAdmin for, uh, for Mongo. Um, or maybe there are some things out there, but do you know of something that's kind of cool? Um, well, we have the, what's on the Mongo HQ. Yeah, yeah I mean, some, pl some like Mongo HQ uh, has made kind of an explorer, but it's still not the same thing. Like, it's, it's, it's really antiquated. So we need some better tools to be able to visualize this. SQL Pro and Mac is really cool because it connects via SSH uh, to your, your, your server, and then you can explore. It's just like PHP MyAdmin without exposing it to the world. You go through SSH, and then you can view all your collections and stuff. Nothing like that in Mongo. And it's really incredibly frustrating to not be able to see what you're working with. Um, so what's the love child actually look like? Uh, we, uh, we've talked about this a lot. In Drupal 6, um, the module invoke all, this is like the most evil function ever, right? It's really cool because it lets you hook into anything anywhere. But if you think about what's happening there, is it's just looping through every bit of code that possibly could be running. And it's saying, hey, you got anything for me? You want me to run anything? And it's like, nope. And it's like, all right, I'm going to go to the next guy and see if he's got anything for me. And then he may have something. And then he does it. And then like every page load, it's going through every single thing. Um, now, when you have caching, uh, that, that kind of takes a little bit out. But it's still looping through everything every single time, which is really inefficient. Drupal 7. Uh, we cache those kind of like paths. So it knows roughly what functions it should be running at any given time, because the actual kind of chain is cached. 
So that's a little bit better. Drupal 8, though, um, we're going to be doing like event-driven, more event-driven stuff. So if you think about Meteor, it's not moving until something changes that it should be moving for. So nothing updates until it should absolutely be updating. It's like the Zen master, completely at peace, and then you know a fly moves, and then it grabs it with the chopsticks. Um, and Drupal is just like swatting with chopsticks everywhere, hoping that he gets a fly. So uh, we need to get more like that Zen master. And uh, you know, in this case, the event-driven stuff with Symphony, we're actually going to be able to register events and respond to those, but we're still going to have the hook system. And a lot of people are going to do the hook system still. So uh, we need to get closer and closer to this event-driven nature just baked right into our whole paradigm. And it's kind of hard with PHP, because um, that's not, that's not kind of like the origins of PHP. But um, in Meteor, I can't tell you how freaking cool it is that you can just like in 10 minutes make an app that somebody a, a thousand miles away can change a field and you see it right there. It's just so cool. You didn't have to do anything. So uh, we, need, we need to get that. Uh, what's Drupal 9 going to do? I don't know. Uh, you know. What's Drupal 10 going to do? I don't know. But it's probably going to be towards that trend. And it's gonna, it's, it, we have to learn from these things because this is what, uh, I mean, we have no choice. We've got to get efficient. We shouldn't be uh, wasting resources. Uh, the love child will reject coolness for coolness's sake. How many people have seen something cool and you're just trying to figure out a way to use it, right? Like this is, our, this is us with Node right now. We're like, how can I do Node? What can I do? What can I, what can I use this for? How can I inject this into my application? And that's, that's not the way we should be thinking. Um, we should be looking at all these things as kind of tools in our tool chest. And when we come up with a problem that this new technology solves, we use that. So the perfect example is how a lot of people are using Node and Meteor is with feeds, right, and subscriptions. And you know, rather than the client pulling a Drupal server for new stuff all the time, it just sends it out when it actually needs it. Um, that's pretty cool. That, that uses a, uh, that's a very practical application of this. Um, but it's kind of hard to come up with stuff otherwise. And if you can't come up with anything, just don't do it, right? I mean, we can't be cramming a bunch of stuff in just because it's cool. Um, and we just have to keep that in mind. Um, and on that note, um, sometimes stuff doesn't need to be real time, right? Sometimes you don't need this event-driven nature. Uh, if it's like a chat thing or like we're doing an inventory management system in Meteor um, or like this card thing where you've, you're doing a collaborative resource planning endeavor um, with Pushpin Planner, that needs to be real time. But uh, your comments on your web page uh, that people like come in, read something, and then comment and then leave, that probably doesn't need to be real time. And if it does need to be real time, probably just a you know, one minute update is probably fine. You know? um, but I guess my point to this is let's just think about whether the things that Meteor is doing or Node is doing are actually necessary because you're going to accept a bunch of other stuff along with that, its own set of baggage. Um, and you don't want to have to deal with that just because you wanted to do something cool. So this point was reject coolness for coolness's sake. We also need to embrace coolness for coolness's sake. Um, because, uh, you know, cool, I think I swapped these actually in these slides. I mean, the point to this is uh, Drupal, Drupal sometimes, I mean, have you ever gotten like to that point where you're like, I don't want to make another content type. Like, I can't do it. I just cannot do it, right? It's just so monotonous sometimes because that's kind of the beauty of Drupal. Drupal made stuff so easy, whereas before it used to take us, like I was saying, with developing back end stuff. Uh, you just wanted to you just wanted to kill yourself. It was so monotonous and, and just you know horrible. Then Drupal made that really easy. Now we have that same thing, but with the easy stuff. We want to be doing custom stuff. We want to be doing fun stuff. And uh, you know when when you got to do the the boring way, um, it's just not as much fun. So developers don't enjoy it as much. And then they're trying to look to the cool stuff like we're doing from Drupal to Node. Um, we need to like engage our developers. We want to make sure that it's fun to do this stuff. And if it's not fun, I don't know, we got to structure things in a way that you know, really creative people aren't stuck doing stuff that's not very much fun. And in fact, Drupal kind of does that, right? You can give the client stuff to do. You can say, you go make the content, dude. I don't need to make this. I'm going to make the content type. And you go make the content. Or you can even add stuff with the content type. Here's the principle. You want a field, add a field, and then it's good. I don't need to do that. You don't need to pay me a ridiculous sum to to add this field. So we can kind of do that, but people want to go to fun stuff because it's fun. Um, and I think we need to do that. The, the other thing is uh, at DrupalCon Denver, 
Uh, Dries said we need to improve the authoring experience. Now one of the clunkiest things about Drupal is that it's just so static, right? You go in and you see this WYSIWYG and you go through all these fields and you update all this stuff and then you hit save and hope that nobody else saved that page already and then it's going to say, you know, you can't save this. And you're like, oh crap. But, you know, it's just like uh, you could imagine a really slick authoring experience where the moment you make your changes and you hit save, uh, it, it, it just saves throughout the whole thing. I mean, we kind of have that, right? What is it? Uh, was it Spark or what's the... What's the new, the new thing baked into Drupal 8, the, the in-place in editor? You get, yeah, so that's really cool. I don't know if you guys have played around with that, but we saw it at DrupalCon is you can click a field, and then it edits it in, on the page in real time, and then when you click away, it saves it. That's kind of getting towards that. Um, but that makes things actually fun. It's, uh, uh, it's the clients enjoy doing that kind of stuff too. That has its own set of challenges, right, when you have like a view that you're editing, and it's a field and a view. Um, but you know, we'll, we're, already, we're already addressing that and we're going to get to the conclusion of that. You know, we're going to move towards that. And the last point is um, this love child is doing just what it needs to do. It's updating just what it needs to be updating. I love the fact that our app does not move until it needs something. But you think about the other extreme in Drupal, right? Node load and node save. You load a node, it loads everything. And then you like update the title and then you save it, and it saves everything. That is so wasteful, right? That's, that can bring down so many apps because you're doing a node load or a node save. It's really fun that you can just load something with one command and have access to it, um, but then when you save it, you know, you're, you're like gonna bring down your server to its knees. That's really dangerous. Um, and we, we, we have to move more towards this granular approach, and I think the in-place editing in Drupal is kind of doing that, um, but for developers, you know, we should be able to do like a node save, you know, in, in something very specific without having to, to um, update everything. And we may very well be doing that, but I think we just need to be doing more and more things like that. So, you have any final thoughts on that? I'm looking forward to the questions, actually. <laughs> Steve was excited about the questions. I wasn't excited about the questions because I don't want you to ask me something I don't know. But Steve will know it, so it's, we're going to work out great. So, what's up? You have a question? Uh, Yeah, so this is really interesting. This is a big problem. Uh, the question was, what are we doing to host our app in production? Are we using Heroku? Um, so you could actually spin up a server like Node and Meteor. Meteor has its own kind of like server baked in, but when you deploy it, uh, you know, it, it, you're going to have to uh, start Meteor. And I don't want to have to deal with like production hosting. So we actually tried Heroku. And um, it worked okay. It, it, once you get up to a certain memory limit, if, you're, if your app's inefficient, um, it'll just shut it down, and which kind of sucks. Um, and it doesn't really tell you. Uh, but when you, the real challenge is when you actually need to have multiple instances. When you need to have multiple servers serving your app, what do you do then? Because let's think about the problem here. You've got uh, two servers, and you don't know which one it's going to end up going to, the ultimate request. It's going to be making a lot of requests. So this, this server knows some data about that session. And then the next time you make your request, it goes to this other server. And then uh, it's like, I don't know anything about your whole thing. You know? So it's like, I'll just refresh everything, give you everything from scratch. So you need to have this thing called session affinity, which means that the first time you go through the, se the server, it just keeps going to that server. And then the next time somebody else comes through, it keeps going to that one. Um, so that the one server knows you, you're, you're kind of like its, it's, uh, it's, it's client. Um, Heroku doesn't have that, so that's a big problem. You could spin up a bunch of Heroku servers, but your app's going to break. So then you can go to, there's a couple others in for, for, uh, that'll, that'll help you serve Node. Uh, Modulus.io can do it. They actually wrote a really cool application that um, will take your Meteor app, and it's called Demeteorizer, so it'll turn it into just a regular Node app, and then you deploy that. Um, and you kind of have to do that. With Heroku, you had to have what's called a build pack. And the build pack would kind of build your server and download everything and start your Heroku instance. With Modulus, uh, you, de you run Demeteorizer, you tell it what no node version you want it to run, and then it spins up a node application on Modulus and lets you, Modulus is kind of cool because you can see all the server statistics in the dashboard. Um, but we were still running into issues uh, with the, the kind of the session affinity stuff. For some reason, maybe it, Maybe it was our app, it probably was our app, some bug that we didn't track down. So we, 
Jump Ship, and then we went to No Jitsu. Uh, and that is, uh, the interface is really horrible, but the servers are more high performance. And um, it, it seems to work a little bit better for us. It's the same kind of idea. You have to run Demeteorizer, which Modulus produced, but we're using it for, to deploy our Node apps um, on No Jitsu, um, which is kind of a little unfair. But, uh, you know, but that's the only thing you can do right now. So Nojitsu works pretty well, um, and you can spin up multiple servers, and it's cost effective, and you can have multiple environments. Um, so that's what we're doing. Yeah, that's where we've had the best luck on Nojitsu. Yeah, we've had the best luck on Nojitsu. What's up? Yeah, uh, Steve will talk about this. You can actually use a lot of those in Meteor. So Meteor is just a collection. You know, they, they can take this analogy as far as they want, right? Like they, it's a collection of applications. You get it, like stars and like in this universe. And uh, they, you can go, you can go really, you can get really cheesy with this analogy. But you can use any, any template rendering system you want. You can use Backbone. You can use all sorts of stuff in Meteor. The thing is, my philosophy on this, and Steve will have some comments about this, is uh, at a certain point, there's so much stuff out there, you just got to pick something and, and do it, you know? Is Otherwise, you're going to go nuts. Is the meteor considered a, a framework, or is it more just a collection? It's a collection of packages. I just say framework because uh, that's, a lot more, that's a lot more understandable than going like, well, Meteor is kind of like this collection of stuff, so yeah. But Meteor does have some philosophies in terms of the, the, service, or the client side collections. Um, and you know the the, the client side collections and, and mapping the templates to when data is changing, um, that was that was something that that w really drew me to Meteor. And, and we did look at some of the other frameworks, but I mean sometimes it's just overwhelming. And, and like Casey was saying, you just kind of have to decide what you're what you're going to do. But th what really drew me to Meteor was the, the the templating and 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 being able to update the templates simply by doing database um, inserts and updates and all that kind of good stuff. Yeah, have you ever tried to explain to your mom what a CMS is? Right? Like, what's a CMS? Well, mom, it's kind of like this thing. You know, that's kind of what you run into with Meteor because it's not like anything that a lot of people have ever encountered. It's kind of like a framework. It's kind of like a language, well, not really a language, but it's a collection of stuff. It's got its own things baked in. So that's what it is. It's not very concise, but. Uh, we just, he, he asked, what does our client side toolkit look like? We just went straight Meteor on everything. Um, I don't want to let all this crazy stuff into my life. Uh, I mean, I don't, some stuff is better than other stuff, um, and they all have pros and cons. So um, ultimately, we just went with straight Meteor because Meteor is not even uh, 1.0 release yet. Uh, it's still beta, so I don't want to be, you know, messing around with stuff that when they actually do the 1.0 release uh, is going to be incompatible with the whole thing that my application was developed on. So uh, that's my thought. If we find something like we were going to move to Backbone because of the routing and then we just, you know, I just went to a, a Meteor dev shop and just got in the room with, with the team that was doing the routing and we just hashed it out, right? Like we just talked about all the, the, the issues with routing and it's like, okay, well, we'll just make the routing package in Meteor better. So uh, that's kind of our approach to that. Any more questions? They actually kind of wrote a, a, a mini MongoDB in, in JavaScript. Um, so it doesn't support every um, function that, that Mongo has. So you, you can't just go to the Mongo uh, website and look at the documentation and expect to be able to run all those, all those neat functions. But y you're, you're literally, in your JavaScript code, you are writing to uh, what feels like a, a Mongo um, engine. And that's all you pretty much need to do, and after that, the uh, the client and the server exchange the data and make sure everything's kosher. Yeah, it's it's pretty crazy. Like the way that you and for anybody that didn't hear, he was just saying like, how does this magic work with client side Mongo stuff, right? So that's what Steve was answering. But it's really nuts. I mean, how do you debug? How do you know what everything you have uh, access to? You open up Firebug and you say like, fetch all the cards, and it just shows you the card objects right there. And that's kind of crazy, right? Like you're, you're just querying the database from Firebug. Um, 
there's actually, when you first start your media project, you can turn on the, what's called the insecure module um, and auto publish and you see everything in the whole server. So everybody's cards you, can, you, can, you have access to. You turn that off before you go to production. But that just kind of blew my mind that I could just update the application um, from Firebug uh, and have it make changes server side. It was so crazy. It's kind of scary. Um, but but it was it's 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 really cool. So uh, what else you guys got? Uh, what's up? What's the big, uh, largest number of users that you've had to uh, support? Are, are your customers uh, like an internet application, or do you have anything that's exposed to the the internet that you could have potentially tens or hundreds or thousands of, of people on it? How would it behave in that kind of an internet? Yeah, so Meteor.com, um, it's a Y Combinator backed company. I think they got like $7 million in funding or something, and that's what they're doing to push Meteor forward. Um, they get a lot of traffic to Meteor.com, and that's in Meteor. And it's actually on the same server that all their, uh, their dev sites, like you can spin up a Meteor, Meteor app, and you can do a Meteor deploy, and it goes to their Meteor servers. Um, it's the same server. So uh, they get you know, hundreds of thousands of, you know, in some cases when they have this new stuff out or when Meteor launched, they had hundreds of thousands of visitors simultaneously, um, or tens of thousands, I don't know. I didn't look at their Google Analytics, but it was a lot. Uh, how does it scale, though? We hit a problem with just a couple of users. Our app was like crashing to the ground. It was like, oh, crap, what are we doing wrong, right? So we had to go through, and uh, you know, this is another issue with Meteor and Node, is it's kind of hard to debug stuff. Like We don't have a lot of the same tools that we have in PHP to, to run this, especially if you're doing something like Nojitsu, which is just to an abstraction on top of Amazon Web Services. So we don't even have full access to the server. So in this instance, the way that we backtrack that we shouldn't be exposing these collections to anonymous users is that we just did a memory output every second or every like half second, right? So we've just, we can actually do a console log and look at all the, um, the, the output of the memory as we do stuff. So you would just see the memory and you would see that every time you went to it, it would add, it would take kind of like a chunk of memory. And then you know, you'd have a bunch of users, and then Meteor will keep a session for 15 minutes just in case you're like going through a tunnel on your phone, and then you come out of the tunnel, and it'll reconnect. And it's like, OK, let's continue where we left off. That's kind of cool. But it kind of sucks if you know, the guy just came, and then he left, and he's never going to come back. And you've now got that memory allocated to him for 15 minutes. That's kind of scary, right? And then another thing about Meteor that's kind of scary is every tab makes a new session. So every tab has a new requirement for memory. Um, and they do this so that you can have different experiences on, any, on every tab. Now, they, uh, uh, Percolate Studio, uh, Tom Coleman and Zoltan, they, they, these guys are like real core contributors. Uh, really, uh, everything that, that is in Meteor has their names on it. They just made a new, uh, a new module that allow you to, to untie tabs that are not active. So you could just have the active tab listening to the server. But that's kind of like uh, you're addressing this problem. Um, you know, so how does Meteor scale? Uh, it can scale pretty well as long as you are uh, addressing the issues of only giving data to one person, and then you, you can always just add more servers, right? You could just, you know, throw more resources at it. We're familiar with that solution in Drupal, right? So, <laughs> you know. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of a work in progress as well. I mean, you, you're, we're running into issues all the time. We had lots of performance problems, even on the client side performance and server side. So. Um, it's definitely not something that, that's you know done. Yeah, yeah. We're we're still working through this stuff, um, but true to like just get it out the door. I would much rather get it out and pay for a couple more servers and work on the the server issues than like try to perfect our application and then launch it when it's perfect. Um, we just got to iterate on this stuff because a lot of the stuff, like I said, it's not even uncovered. Like we're finding our own blog posts, so uh, you know we just got to get more information out there and we got to play around with it more. So what else we got? Anything? Are we, how are we doing on time? Yeah. Cool. Uh, we got five minutes. So uh, anything else? Sure. Oh wait. All right. Sorry. Are we? Yeah. Okay. One more question. Yeah. Your client's gonna crash, so you don't have to worry about that. <laughs> Yeah. I know that there's that backside. How much actual information is going back and forth over time? I mean, is it just like ping? Like I, 
it, it could be a lot, right? I mean, it, it could be if, if you've got your application that's listening to everything that makes changes, it's getting all those changes, right? So, um, you know, you could, you could make a really hairy situation or, or your, your customers could make a really hairy situation if, if you're not thinking about it. So you just got to think about it, you know? There's solutions for all this stuff, but you just got to think about it, and really that takes having it crash a couple times and then figuring it out. So we got to go and let's just wrap up. Yeah, you just really got to make sure that you're, you're trying to minimize that amount of data that's going back and forth. And that's what's, what's cool about the subscriptions is that when you set up that subscription, it's set up so that you're trying to keep it as, as minimal as possible. But if you've got a bunch of tabs open and you're not doing a lot of work, um, it's not going to be, I mean, you're going to have a lot of connections to the server um, with socket IO, but it's not going to be, um, it's not going to be doing a lot of work unless there's a lot of data going back and forth. Cool. Thank you guys. Thank you guys very much. This is great. Appreciate your time.